Thanks be to God. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? These are amazing words that Paul writes to the church at Corinth. This is a statement of bold faith that the power of death has been conquered through the resurrection of Jesus and that we who follow him dare to proclaim that death has been robbed of its victory, no longer has its sting. Death has been conquered and we can look across the rest of our lives without fear, holding on to our faith that, as Paul puts it elsewhere, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is to have the joy and purpose of following Christ, and to die is to gain the kingdom of God. Death is conquered not by permanent avoidance, not by a never-ending day-by-day struggle to push it off one more day, but by following Christ through life, through death, the way that he has paved through the cross and resurrection. Right? That's, that's our faith. That's what we proclaim, that death has been conquered. That does not make death an ice cream sundae to be enjoyed. It makes death still the enemy. Death is still not a part of the plan. At, at most, at best, it is always a horrible separation between loved ones. And at worst, death can be a horrible moment that leaves scars on a family. When it comes to the situation of death, I hear people, just this week I was talking to someone who uh, had heard in a sermon that uh, this person had to die as part of God's plan. And every once in a while I hear that horrible phrase, God needed another angel. No. No, no, no. No, no, no. No. It is horrible and wrong for, for people to die young. And, and when people die and it is a tragedy, the best I can say is that God weeps with us, just as Jesus wept with Lazarus' sisters when Lazarus died. And what makes it so evil is that it does not make sense. If it did make sense, it wouldn't be so, so evil. right? And so death is an evil thing, but it has been conquered. Now, it's a challenge to understand. It is a fence against our, uh, we, our sense of how the world should go. And so we, do, we, we tend not to talk about it, right? When's the last time you had a good conversation about death? I mean, we just don't, we don't talk about it very often. We don't acknowledge it. We don't talk about it. We clean it up and sterilize it. Most people die in hospitals. And what color are hospitals? White, right? Because we want it clean and sterile and under control. And so we deny death. And what happens so often is uh, someone starts that process of dying and, and you hear someone say, it's just happening so fast. It happens so fast. And then a doctor comes in and says, should we do everything? Right? And you have your loved one there in the bed and the machines that go ping going off and they're on the, the, the tubes and all that and the doctor asks, should we do everything? And what do you say? Yes! You do everything. This is my mama. This is my dad. This is my, my brother. This is my, my child. You do everything. How can you not do everything? Especially if you might feel a little bit guilty because you haven't been to see him as often as you might. Of course you do everything. And then the doctors do everything. And you ever seen how ugly death can be when the doctors do everything? Right? That can get real ugly, can't it? All right. Compared to doctors and nur uh, nurses in funeral homes, I don't see as much death, but I did the math. I see uh, nine a year. That's my average. I am with nine people dying a year or nine families do doing funerals a year, two every three months. So I I've been around a lot of families who have been coping with this and, and a lot of uh, situations where people die. There is one particular one where they said yes to everything that still haunts me to this day. Uh, I was working as a chaplain at the Duke University Medical Center and um, back in 2002. And I, I was working there, got introduced to my floor, and there was this lady who was kind of in the corner room because they didn't really know where to put her in the hospital. And um, she had been there in the hospital for months because she had this infection she just couldn't beat. And, and the infection would almost take her. She'd go septic, and septic is a polite way of saying you, your limbs start turning blue, your system start shutting down. And, and then she'd bounce back. And then she'd slowly start to fade away. And then she'd bounce back. And she was doing this process of, of almost dying and bouncing back again and again and again. And I would go and talk to her every week. and. Um, it was a hard situation, right? It's hard to know what to hope for. And she was, she believed uh, Jesus was her Lord. She was forgiven. She knew this, but she, she just was stuck there. And, and then uh, she went unconscious and uh, well, didn't, didn't know if she was going to wake back up. And they called in the family. There's only one family member. It was a nephew who lived like four or five hours away. And so he drove in. And I'd never seen him before. And I'd been there for a while at that point. And so I'm looking at him thinking, 
This dude feels guilty. It's his, his family member, and he hasn't been there for her. And he is talking to two doctors. And remember, I'm on the, on the heart floor. And heart doctors are cowboys. They ride in to save the day. They are going to fix you, put in some new valves, re-sew you back up, and off you go, right? Doctors are, they save the day. They are high-powered doctors, right? And so these two doctors are used to fixing things, are talking to this nephew, and they're asking, should we do everything? And should we use these antibiotics or those antibiotics? And, and talking about all the options. And, and as part of her care team, I could be there. And so I was. And two doctors, the nephew and me. And I said something. This is what I, I attempted to say. You know, folks, this lady believes in Jesus. She is forgiven. She does not fear what comes after death. We might just say no. And it would be okay. That's what I tried to say, but I'm not sure I got it out coherently, because about halfway through saying that, they started looking at me like I was speaking Swahili, like I'd grown another head out of my shoulder. They looked at me like I was plumb stupid. I, I very rarely felt so demeaned or dismissed as at that moment. I don't think they even said anything into response. They just turned back to each other and kept on talking. And the doctor said, should we do everything? And the nephew said yes. And when I left, at the end of the semester, she was still in that room, going blue every once in a while, on the edge of death, getting a little bit better, and getting a little bit worse. And it was ugly. I don't know what happened, but it still haunts me, because I saw that, and that is ugly, and we follow Jesus, and it is beautiful to follow Jesus, and we can do better than that. We can do better than that. And you know who does better than that? Doctors. Doctors don't die like that. Doctors, they, they just don't die like that. A friend, uh, I was reading these articles a friend of mine had recommended, and one of them, a doctor by, by, wrote this uh, article, Ken Murray. He wrote this article called How Doctors Die, and he noticed none of his friends who are doctors died in hospitals like that. They died at home, surrounded by their family on hospice. That's how they died. They went home, they took some painkillers, they hung out with their family. Right? He told a story about a, a friend of his, a doctor, Charlie, whose specialty was pancreatic cancer. And, irony of ironies, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And here's the doctor who has invented a procedure that triples the life, life expectancy of people on pancreatic cancer. He's invented this procedure that will give you a five-year a, a success rate, five-year live rate, from five to 15 percent. This is his gig. He got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He walked out the door, didn't step foot in a hospital ever again. No radiation, no chemo, no surgery. Went home, took a little painkillers, went on hospice, hung out with his family, died peacefully at home, surrounded with his family a few months later. That's how doctors die. Stanford uh, Medical Center did a, did a study on this. Did, said, okay, that's a great story, Dr. Murray. You've gathered all these stories, but let's see. 90% of doctors have advanced directives filled out such that if they are in a terminal situation, they are going to turn down all the heroic measures. Right? Ninety percent of doctors in a terminal situation, key phrase, terminal situation, they're going to turn down. They're going to say no. When asked, should we do everything, they say no. Because they've seen it. Right? If you put someone on a feeding tube, they will last for months without dying. Right? You put someone on a ventilator, you know what a ventilator does? It breathes for you, right? But it breathes against you because your rhythm of breathing and its rhythm of breathing are never going to line up. And so it feels like someone is shoving air into your throat. And so they have to paralyze you so that you don't pull it out. And so you're sitting there paralyzed, something breathing against you, and you can't move. Right? This is horrible. And so they've seen that. They've seen CPR. Right? What does CPR do in a terminal situation? You're an older person. How effective? I want to know, what's your guess? You don't get to guess, and, and, and neither do you. But what is your guess on the effectiveness rate on CPR? How effective do you think it is? One month out from having CPR, how many people do you think are alive? If you watch the TV shows, do you, what, what's the number on TV shows? Right? 75%. Uh, 75, if you watch the TV shows, three quarters of people make it after CPR, and then they're up and running for the next episode. Right? The actual number is 8%. If you have CPR, 8% of people are alive a month later. Right? And if you're elderly, if you're older, it might, you might be alive with all of your ribs broken. 
Right? And so doctors say no to all of these things. If doctors in terminal situations say no to tubes and vents and CPR. They go home and they die at, at home. Right? And, and to be clear, it's that terminal situation, the, the terminal uh, diagnosis that makes a difference. It's very different for a doctor in his or her 30s to be in a car wreck. You do everything you can to save a person like that. But someone in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, you get a cancer diagnosis. If you live another month with broken ribs after CPR and you have a vent down your throat, ugh, right? That's no way to go. You're just prolonging death. And, and you can push this image a bit further. I mean, it's a big, there's a big difference between, do you put a new transmission into a 2014 F-150? Yeah. Do you put a new transmission into a 1980 F-150? Right? If you do, the brakes are about to go. Or something else is, right? There's a certain point at which you can fix this, but that's going to break. And you just got to acknowledge that and say, it's time to say no. Doctors, right? Doctors have figured out how to die well. And it's not even just Christian doctors. It's all of doctors have figured out when the situation is terminal, there comes a time to say no, go on hospice, and go home. And so you might ask, why don't the doctors, who this is how they die, right? Why don't we die like doctors? Well, there's been a profound shift in our culture and how we, raise, how we train our doctors, right? It's hard to do, it has become harder and harder for doctors to help us because of what they have been trained. You may have noticed I have two children. We saw the difference in how doctors are trained between the birth of child one and child two. Child one, Sophia, neither child was delivered in, a, in, a, in the way that we expected to go down. Everything worked out fine, but Olivia had a cesarean section twice. And the first time, we had a doctor who had been trained decades ago, this wonderful, wise Russian lady over in Kirksville. And when things started to get a little bit hinky, she said, folks, you can do A. And I, we said, do you have any other options? She said, you know, you can do B or C, but you're going to do A. Yes, ma'am, we did A. We did as we were told. The doctor was the one who knew what we needed to do. Wise counselor, trusted woman. She'd been around the block. We'd been working with her. We trusted her. We did it. It was great. Right? Second child, the Russian lady had retired. Such a bummer. And uh, we had this lady. Um, she was good. Like five years out of medical school. She goes on medical missions, uh, mi mission trips. She is a great woman. I would love to have coffee with her. I like her, right? And, and something went a little bit sideways. A and we said, okay, doc, what do we do? And she said, well, you could do A, B, C, or D. Okay, doc, what should we do? Well, you can do A, B, C, or D, right? What would you do? You can do A, B, ah! I was so frustrated, right? Here are Olivia's on, ah, right? That's, doctors don't tell us what to do because there are two things, right? There are two fears that, that, that are driving the, the change in me medicine such that doctors can't just flat out tell us very often, it's time to say no. First, there's the fear of lawsuits. The guy, Ken Murray, who wrote this article about the, how doctors die, wrote about a time when he had it in writing. He had the patient's wishes in writing. No tubes, no vents, no feeding tube, no CPR, and the dude fell. He ended up in the emergency room, right? He, and the family goes to the hospital, and the doctor goes to the hospital, and it's happened, right? It's, he's on all the tubes. And so the next day, he has his paperwork. He doesn't want this. And so he's there with the family. The family agrees. They pull all the tubes. The guy dies peacefully within 30 minutes. And a nurse reports him for a potential homicide. Right? This isn't even just like lawsuits from all practice. This doctor was charged. Right? It got dismissed. But I mean, so there's this fear that if you don't do everything, someone's going to take it wrong. Right? And, and it could get ugly. So there's that, and the second thing that drives this um, doctors, the, the challenge for doctors and nurses is, is called a values imposition. If I'm a Christian and my doctor is not, or vice versa, right? can I impose my values as a Christian upon them, or can I assume that they share my worldview? And, and so there, there's come this time, we've hit this, this point where we have to decide to say no. Right? We've hit this point where we are the ones who have to say no because doctors are not likely to tell us it's time to say no. Right? The nurses, I mean, they'll do what they're told, but they, they'd rather not. Right? It, it is time. We are the ones who have to learn to say no when it's time. If we're in good health, you say yes to everything. I mean, God, I mean, God forbid if I'm in an accident tomorrow, yes, do everything. I want to be there to raise my kids. However, if it's not... 
in terminal situations, we have to be the ones who are bold enough to say no, because the default is yes. Right? The default, if we don't make our wishes clear, the doctors and the nurses will do everything. Even if a person is going to die anyways. And this, this just makes things ugly. I heard one medical ethicist as a thought experiment. He said, uh, we should stop all medical research because we don't seem to be able to say no. And the more tools and skills and procedures we develop, they cost more, they hurt more, they don't extend our life very much. They're just making the situation worse if we stop all medical research because we just can't learn to say no. What I'm saying is we do need to learn to say you no. Know, we need to learn to say no, to die like doctors, right? To say no when it is time, go on hospice, go home, spend time with family, be calm, be peaceful, just trust. It'll be okay. And so what we need to do beforehand to learn to say no is prepare, right? There's some things we need to prepare. First, we've got to talk to our doctors, our primary... Most important thing is have a good relationship with your primary care physician and to fill out one of these. Right, here it is. Here is the Sullivan County Memorial Hospital Acknowledgement of Advanced Healthcare Directive and Advanced Healthcare Directive Options. Isn't that a fun mouthful? This is a, that's a long way of saying, what do you want? Right? And if you haven't filled out one of these, do it. And if you have any questions about how to fill it out, you know how to talk to. <laughs> right? Talk to your primary care physician about this because he or she can be the one to guide you through. Like, it, when you fill this out, I'm not sure exactly how I should fill this out. I have a degree in biology, I have a, some challenges with this. Fill this out so you can tell them, yes, I want IV, but no, I don't want tubes. Yes, I want antibiotics, but no, I don't want this. Go through and talk with your doctor and, and discern, is it time to say no to this? if this happens, right? Fill out the advanced directive, figure it out ahead of time, fill it out, get it to your doctor, have them get it to the hospital, and then talk to the person who's gonna be the one who's called, right? If, some, if something happens to one of you, God forbid, tomorrow, the first they're gonna call your spouse, they'll be the first decision maker. Don't have a spouse, they'll go to your kids, right? And if the, your kids, you don't have kids to make a decision, they're gonna go to Joanne Brummett as the public administrator and she will decide your fate. I like her, but I don't know if she knows what you want. So you, you, you fill the, these things out now so that, um, and if you don't have someone to make the decision, you can fill out a power of attorney and pick someone. But it's a lot easier to do it now than fill it out later. All right, tell people what you want, when to say no. If we don't tell our loved ones when to say no, they will have to figure it out for us, and that's a horrible burden, and there's a lot of guilt in that, too, if they don't choose, if they're not certain about what you wanted. The other thing to figure out ahead of time is uh, money. Can we acknowledge that some of us are going to end up in nursing homes? The nursing homes cost $4,000 a month, and if you go into a nursing home without making fiscal arrangements, well, let's just say I know of someone who went into a nursing home and had no fiscal arrangements and just started paying for it. And all the money the family was going to inherit, all the money that had been amassed by the family that was going to be passed down to the children was burned. All of it. <laughs> you know how that goes, right? If you don't make the arrangements at least five years ahead of time, they don't count. Right? You've got to make them ahead of time. Right? So we, we, make our, we talk to our doctors, we talk to the lawyers, we get our will, we talk to our loved ones. And then during the, the crisis, we ask the ver two simple questions. Right? If a loved one is in a hospital, here's the only two questions that matter. Will this person survive? And if they're not going to survive, how will this impact their last days? Do you really care about anything else? Right? If they're not going to make it, let's not make it any harder than, than it has to be. Right? And you can ask, what would you do if it was your mother, right? your brother, your parent, whoever? Right? Just, just ask. When it's, and it's time to let... I was talking to uh, Cheryl Lowry, a name you might know. that She was up uh, earlier this week, and, and she told me to make sure to tell you that uh, when you're in that moment of crisis and it is time when a person is, is dying, you've got to tell them it is, it's okay to go or else they will hang on. You just got to be the one to tell them. The nurses can't tell them. The doctors can't tell them. It's got to be the person they love telling them it's okay to go. Well, that's what to do ahead of time. That's what to do in the day of the crisis. Day-to-day -day living right now, the key to dying well, 
And the key to being able to say no when it's time to say no is living your faith well today. Now John Wesley realized this. He was terrified of death for 35, until he was 35 years old, until he realized that death, you can die a good death, but to do so requires you learn to pray today. Don't try to learn to pray on your deathbed. All right? You learn to worship today so that you've learned to trust Jesus in the good times so you can trust Jesus when they're in the rough times. Forgive and work out the family problems now so that they're not looming when someone is whooped. Right? I don't want to do any more funerals. I say that. I'm about to do one tomorrow. I don't want to do any more funerals, but I'm going right? to. I've already done three this year. It's still early in the year. What you can do to make sure that uh, your faith is honored, that you know that death is defeated, what you can do to make the funerals for you and yours go well is to make sure you are prepared. Fill out the living will. Fill out the will. Talk to people. When is it time to say no? It is your last gift to your family and to your friends, and in doing so, you say yes to your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to a time when we confess when we have fallen short of God's calling upon our lives. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church.